Hi, I'm Jordan from Kettner Creative. In this video, I'm going to show you the SSL2 Plus audio interface from Solid State Logic. Solid State Logic has always made some of the nicest recording equipment, and now we finally have an audio interface with their name on it. This thing is super cool, has tons of different features, and it comes in at a great price point. Now, since the price is always changing on this type of equipment, we have some links in the description below for you to check out if you wanna see the current price and any specs that we may have missed in this video. Now before we show you how this interface works and how it sounds with the microphone, let's talk about what you get when you order this item. What comes in the box? When you open your box, you will find a USB-C to USB-C cable, a USB to USB-C cable, documentation, and the SSL2 Plus audio interface. With this interface as well, you get a whole bunch of different software. You get SSL Vocal Strip 2, SSL drum strip, an extended trial of the complete SSL suite, you get native instruments hybrid keys and complete start, you get Avid Pro Tools first, Ableton Live Lite, and a gig and a half of samples from Loop Cloud. Now again, before we get to the demo of this, let's just quickly go through the specs. For the specs of this device, we have 48 volts of phantom power. We get a bit depth of 24. The sample rates are from 44.1 all the way up to 192 kilohertz. For mic preamps, we have a gain range up to 62 decibels, an EIN of minus 30.5 dBU. What this means is that you're getting a ton of output out of these preamps and a very, very low noise, which is a super good mix to have. SSL absolutely killed it with these mic preamp specs, especially for this price point. We also have a max instrument input level of plus 15 dBU, a max line input level of plus 24 dBU. For monitor outputs, we have a dynamic range of 112 dB, an output level of 12.5 dBU. Headphone outputs come with a dynamic range of 111 dB, a max output of 10 dBU. And for connectivity, we do have USB-C on the back of this device, and it's completely plug and play with a Mac, or if you're using Windows, it's compatible with Windows 8.1 or Windows 10 Plus with an appropriate driver that comes with it, or you can download that from the website. Now, before we get into plugging stuff into this, let's just quickly cruise around the device. If you're looking for the SSL2, I'll try to point out the differences between the SSL2 Plus, like I have, and the SSL2 as we move around the device. So on the back of the device here, we're super happy to see that it has USB-C. I believe this should be the standard on every new audio interface. So we're gonna plug this into the computer so we can get the lights working. Now on the SSL2 Plus, we have MIDI in and out. That does not come with the SSL2. We have two headphone jacks. On the SSL2, you'll only get one headphone jack. We get RCA outputs and we get balanced quarter inch outputs as well. On the SSL, you do not get the RCA outputs out of this audio interface. Then we have Neutrik combo jacks here. So we have mic level inputs, quarter inch line level inputs and quarter inch instrument level inputs, depending on what you're wanting to record. Now, as we look at the front of this device here, we can see right away we have this USB power light letting us know that it's turned on. There is no on off switch for this device, so please keep that in mind. Now, starting at the top, we have two identical channel strips. We have channel one and channel two. Each come with their own 48 volts of phantom power. It does take a minute it will, or a couple seconds. It will mute the input, turn on 48 volts, and then unmute the input for you. Now, if you're using XLR inputs, it's ready to go. But if you're using quarter inch line level inputs, you just gotta press that line level button. And if you're using instrument inputs, like an electric guitar or electric bass, you leave the line level button pressed and you'd add the high Z button to it. Next, we have this LED strip. You can see here that it moves in minus 10 increments from zero all the way down to minus 40. This is super cool, but I do wish that we had a bit more detail somewhere between minus 20 and zero. If we had minus 15 and minus five as well, that would be super helpful, I think. 
Next, we have the gain here. It goes from zero all the way to 10. These gain knobs are built super well, almost no movement side to side on them whatsoever. They feel he heavy, but not too heavy, but they do definitely stay where you want them. No clicks or no intervals there. The nice heavy uh, rotation on it, which feels good when you're adjusting the level there. And then below that, we have the 4K switch. Now the 4K switch is super cool. It's one of the features that make this stand apart. It tries to emulate the old SSL 4000 uh, vibes that people loved. What they say is it adds some kind of distortion to it, or as they call it, they call it mojo. And then it also adds a high-end EQ boost as well to give that more present voice. It really does open up some microphones super well. We'll try this device with some microphones coming up, both with and without that 4K button switch engaged. Now this 4K button here, it has a nice click to it as well. Feels super durable, like you can beat on this thing for years to come. As we move over, we see here again that USB light just letting us know that we are powered up. We have this monitor knob for the balanced quarter inch outputs and RCA outputs on the back. And it does go from all the way from zero to 11. So again, anything that you record on a device that goes to 11, you just know it's gonna sound better no matter what. Super cool that SSL adds funny little things like that to their audio interface. Next, we have the monitor mix knob here. So this will allow you to pan between your zero latency inputs on the device itself and the content that's coming from your DAW, the playback that you're trying to record to or mix with. You also get a stereo button here. This will allow you to switch between keeping both inputs in both ears or panning input one to your left and input two to your right to keep them separate if you're doing some stereo stuff or you really want to keep them separate. Next, we have two different sets of headphone volume. Again, if you have the SSL2, not the 2 Plus, you will just have a single headphone volume. Here, by default, they are both mirrored. They'll take the same content from your DAW, but you can press this 3, 4, and if you have another output set up on your DAW, then you can create a second monitor mix for your headphone B. And here we have this audio interface set up with the Shure SM7B. We all know that the Shure SM7B takes a lot of gain to drive. You can see here that I'm getting a pretty good result with it, with the gain set at about eight and a half out of 10. I'm getting somewhere between minus 20 to minus 12 on my DAW here when I'm recording at this level. So that's pretty good. Uh, again, you can turn it up. I, I've experienced that when you turn it up, somewhere between nine and 10 is where you really see that noise floor come in. Uh, maybe I'll try that with you right now. So right here, I'm just gonna leave five seconds of silence at the eight and a half mark, and then I'm gonna turn it up to that 10 mark. So there we have it. That's the Shure SM7B totally cranked up and back back down to that eight and a half mark. As you can see here, there's no cloud lifter or no mic preamp or inline preamp or anything like that. We're just going SM7B straight into the solid state logic SSL2 plus. Now let's try this with the 4K switch engaged just so you can hear how that high frequency boost and a little bit of that analog distortion will affect the input of this microphone. So here we have the Shure SM7B microphone. We've turned on the 4K switch and now you should be able to hear a bit of a high presence boost. Definitely opens up this microphone quite a bit, I think. And we hear a little bit of that distortion in there, that mojo as SSL likes to call it. I'm gonna turn that off. So now let's talk about my overall impressions of this device. Overall, I think that this has a great sounding preamp. I think it has a ton of output. I think it has a very low noise ratio. I love that you can get two different monitor mixes on it. If you're doing something like a home podcast with two different people, you can set up your monitors exactly how you want them. I love that it has USB-C. I love how tight and heavy all the buttons feel. It's just the right amount of weighting. It's super usable. Now, in terms of cons, there's a couple big cons that stand out for me especially from an ergonomics point of view. I don't like how all the jacks, all the I.O. is on the back. This says to me that this is really meant to stay plugged in. So maybe if you're like uh, recording from your desk all the time or you're doing a lot of video conferencing where you're not doing any in and out, it's just all permanently installed, neat and tidy, this kind of 
ergonomic setup would work really well for you. But I think one thing that's majorly missing that they have to address with future versions is I really do think at least one headphone jack needs to be out the front. I think that's a big oversight. A lot of the times when you're working in a studio, you're plugging your headphones from one thing to the other, or you're trying different things. And I think that that's a big oversight, keeping everything on the back. Obviously for me, if I'm doing more reviews on a desk like this, I stand behind it. So it's really good for me. I'm probably gonna use this in a lot of upcoming microphone reviews because I can easily patch things from the back while keeping the device pointed towards the camera. But other than that use case, I think they really bobbled it. I think a lot of people will miss having the IO on the front, but I'm not sure what they were considering. I'm sure there is a reason that they went with this. I'm sure there's a whole class of users out there that prefer it this way. It just doesn't resonate super well with me. Another thing that I think is a big oversight is again with this LED strip. I think that they could have had a little more clarity, something at minus 15 and minus five uh, to keep that minus 30 to minus 20, just hitting it, seeing it touch minus 20 or something. It doesn't really give me the detail that I need. I would really want to see if it's hitting minus 15 or not as well. So that's my review of this unit. Again, if you want to see pricing for anything that you see in this video, we have a whole pile of links in the description below. If you have any questions or comments on this interface, please leave those in the comments section below. And again, if you want to see more videos like this in the future, please like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.